Hey there, I'm George Camel, co-host of The Ramsey Show, and we're back with another edition of the best of The Ramsey Show. This episode features unbelievable disputes between spouses, financial abuse, infidelity, hiding purchases, and addiction. It gets real, and we hear it all. Check this out. Heidi is with us in Atlanta. Hey, Heidi, welcome to The Ramsey Show. Thank you for having me and talking to me today. How are you? Sure. What's up? Um, I'm in a little bit of a predicament. Um, I'm coming to the realization that I'm having to possibly make some decisions that are not only financially. I'm having trouble understanding you. Can you speak directly into your phone, please? Sounds muffled. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. A little better. Go ahead and try again. Talk bold. Okay. Talk bold. Um, yeah. It's just you uh, and me and Dave and like 10 million other people. It's good. Yeah, exactly. Um, I can't speak too loudly because my husband's downstairs and I don't want to be interrupted by him. Um, so I'm in a situation where um, my husband's not wanting to work on our finances together um, this last two and a half years. He has not been contributing towards our uh, joint account at all. Money is completely separated. And uh, recently he informed me that um, if I want my financial situation to change, I have to do something about it. Um, Because I've suggested to him, I've been listening to you for the last month or so here and talking about how if we're going to get out of debt, we need to work on it together. Um, I sent him different shows that you've um, released, and in order for him to listen to it, he's just not on board with it. Um, Why? I had. I'm sorry? Why does he not want to combine your finances? Um, he says that he's got a plan in place that works for him, and um, he's and it not does not include anything. you. Yeah. So, how long has he been having an affair? Yeah. <laughs> Um, our finances basically have been always separated. That wasn't what um, I asked. Since I, I don't know of any particular situation where he is having an affair. Are you safe? Um, yeah, in, in my home, I'm, I'm okay. I just can't speak loudly okay you can't what you can't speak loudly um so y- you just called two guys listening to how you are having to speak in your own home out of fear of a man who calls himself your husband and i need you to hear from me who's also a husband sitting next to another guy who's a husband that safety can come in the form of physical safety, and it can also come in the form of psychological safety where you don't feel welcome in your own house. And Dave's question about, is he having an affair? I need you to hear hear the behavior. Hear what your husband's trying to tell you through his behavior. That is, you are not a priority. Right. His priorities are somewhere else, and he is disinterested in a relationship with you. Correct. Right? And that's heartbreaking, and I'm saying it real direct, and I know that's hard, um, but you are not safe at all. You know that, right? I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You know that, right? Yes, I know that, and this is part of the last four months has been very revealing. There you go. And so Dave's question about an affair, that be, that was that'd be my first question too. Something has changed in this marriage. It was already separate, and we already would have poked at you for having different accounts. Something else has changed. Either he's about to leave, or he already has left, or something has shifted. Or he's in trouble, he's got an addiction issue. Um, something else has shifted. He's in love with something else. Right. Um, is this phone? Um, politics. Um, there's a lot of different things that are distracting him, but we are all in the same house together we, ever since COVID, including the kids. Mm-hmm. How many um, children do you have? Two girls. And what is your income? 
Well, right now it's not where it could be. Um, it's about 40000 What could it be? If I went back to my former career that I left to try to do this RV life with him, um, I could be making upwards of 90 on my own. So M- Maybe what? She could be making upwards of 90 on her own. Oh, 90. Yeah. I didn't hear yeah. the 90. Okay, I'm sorry. And um, how old are your children? 13 and 9. Okay. Can I ask you a real hard question? Yes. Is this the picture of love that you want to communicate to them? No, it's not. And that's, I mean, I've been, you know, wrestling with this, like I said, for the last four months. And after speaking to some of my friends and coming to the realization that, you know, not only is it financial abuse, it's my mental health, it's my children's mental yep, health. There you it's, go. Yep. It's all of it. It's, this is not the person my parents raised. Um, my dad, I was completely, I bought this house on my own single. Um, I was completely debt free when I got married yeah. and that has changed. Okay. And you know, I want I, to get I, back to who I was before. There you yeah. go. So here's what you're going to have to do. Um, your friends aren't who walk through you with this except as friends, but you need to get a good counselor. ASAP. So you need to go see a marriage counselor starting today that is a strong person that will try to help you save your marriage if it's salvageable, that will give you some uh, verbiage and some positions to remind you you're not crazy because you got two guys who are saying you're not crazy. Yeah. Okay? And we're both, we both know this stuff, okay? So um, you need to get a counselor that can guide you through this. You don't want to do this off of a radio call, and you don't want to do this off of your friend's opinion over a glass of wine. You need to get a counselor in your corner that can give you some ways to explain to your husband that what will amount to ultimately an ultimatum. A boundary. A boundary that says you are going to re-engage or you're going to disengage. We're not going to play here in the middle and I'm not going to be abused at this level anymore. And you've got to have someone help you set that boundary, not two guys on the radio. But you're not crazy and you need to do this and you need to do this right now. John, we got to go back to that last caller for a second uh, because there's a whole lot of that In America today. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of different ways that husbands and wives interact over money. There's a situation where they work together and everything's combined and they make decisions together. And when they make decisions on their spending and their investing, they realize that they are truly adding a level of unity, a level of oneness to their relationship, a level of communication to their relationship. And that's plan A. And it has the highest probability of increasing the quality of your marriage and and the highest probability of you becoming wealthy. Plan A does. Plan B is to healthy, mentally mature, emotionally mature people who uh, operate financially like roommates, Mm -hmm. but both of them have a vote and there is a mutual respect and there's communication between them, but they run separate accounts. That's a plan B. There's a, that lowers the probability of wealth building and the quality of the marriage substantially, but it still functions. Mm -hmm. Uh, plan C that's even worse is uh, mom or dad, husband or wife, one of the two, is in charge. Hmm. And the other one is doled out money as an allowance. Well, I got to check with mom. I'll see if I got any money. Hmm. Uh, meaning the wife is in charge of the money. Or I got to ask my husband because he handles all the money. And, uh, or, you know, we don't, I don't know if we, I don't know what we've got. And they die, the one that handles the money dies, and the other one just left clueless and with no skills because they don't have decades of handling anything. They basically are a glorified child being taken care of by an unglorified parent uh, in that setting. And that is damaging to the relationship and it's really damaging to the money, really damaging the money. That plan F where you fail the test is one toxic member of the team is in control of the money and the other person. Finance, that's abuse. With right. toxic financial abuse. Right. The extreme of that is there's a high correlation in the data and in the actual practice, and I've seen it on the financial side. I've talked with other count coaches. You and I have talked about this. Uh, you probably can cite a study. I've just talked to other people that have seen it in practice that if a, if a husband has extreme control 
over the finances to the point that the wife is not allowed to make any, can't go to the grocery store by herself, can't pay any electric bill. She's given $2 at a time, not $2,000 at a time. Uh, extreme control, probably 90 to 95% of the time he's hitting her. Mm. Domestic violence yeah. tied to that. If there's that level of control, you can just about count on it. That last one gets really close to that. That's why my first question was, are you safe, right? Because yeah, you could feel she, it. She wanted to say safe was emotional abuse, but she's upstairs and can't speak yeah. loudly because he's downstairs. That's right. Which makes me wonder about that whole thing. And how many calls have we taken, you and I have taken, that have a couple on, they disagree, they're either laughing about it or they're in jest but serious. That's the first one of these where somebody's hiding upstairs saying, uh, help. It, it, it's uh, not yeah, it's not the first one, sadly, but it won't, it won't be the last one. But the, the point of us bringing this up is, um, I mean, to outline what A plan is, B plan is, C plan is, and F plan is, um, Here's the thing. Every one of those, regardless of who you are and which player you are in that role, is a choice to go forward that way. Right. And I would encourage every one of you to choose to move towards the A plan. Yeah. Um, or if you are unsafe, to choose to get out. Yeah. Uh, whether you're unsafe emotionally or you're unsafe physically. I don't, I don't tell people to file divorce and I don't tell people to file bankruptcy, but there are situations where... You're unsafe. You need to get out of there. And if you find yourself, she mentioned something at the end of that call that just buried itself in my heart a little bit. She said, this isn't who I am. I, I've looked up. I bought this house. I bought it on my own. I had a great career. I was debt free. And now I'm somebody else. That's common a language of somebody who's in an abusive relationship. I have become somebody else. In order to keep, keep myself safe, keep my kids safe, keep this guy from you know, keep his rage, me. keep his rage down. That's right, that's right. And when you look in the mirror and say, "Who are you? Who have you become?" Because there's a rage person in your life. That is signal number one. Call somebody and get some help right away. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. That's um, the, the the wrathful man. Proverbs talks about <sighs> is a dangerous character. Golly, man. It's a dangerous character, and um. Uh, and the sad thing is, is that he's probably has very low coping skills himself, and that's what drives him to rage. That's right, yeah. And he's get some. I'd love for him to get some help as well. And she mentioned something: the number of calls I'm taking, Dave, on my show, the number, the data is bearing it out. The folks over the last COVID. 24 months COVID. who have gotten psychotic about their cell phones and new data and new information and news, uh, it's destroying people. Put your phones down and say, I got a problem, and go re-engage. Or call... You, you get a human being. Get a counselor. Yes. You do not need your... Put your Turn your stupid screen off. God and get around man. human beings. I mean, it's uh, screen time. Uh, people have gone down the, the conspiracy theory or alternate theory or whatever you want to call it, uh, rabbit hole, and they live there. They live... They've moved in. Yeah. Yeah. And so I've had to put up a boundary in my life. I've got a certain number of acquaintances slash friends that I'm like... Not here. Yeah. I'm not I'm not talking about COVID anymore. I'm tired of it. There you go. It's not it's no longer fun. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Yeah. Because you're all stupid. All of you are stupid. <laughs> I'm just not talking about it anymore, you know. And uh, if I die from it, y'all can just y'all make fun of me then. It's right, fine. Right. It's, but it's all good and you can be mad at Dave Ramsey and you're already mad at him, so screw it, you know. Right. Whatever. It's okay. So, um but I mean this whole thing you've got to this rage that has welled up inside of the started with a quarantine Man. and has driven people uh, the fear off of that it's an existential crisis of another kind it is and we are feeling a mass psychosis man we've got dude and this is how nonsense gets started dave that you can't wheel back and so i want people to put their phones down and go call a friend call and ask your close buddies have i been raged out and if they're good friends they'll be honest with you say no or they'll look you out and say yeah we've been worried about you yeah, I've had those moments in my life, man. Well, you get in fight mode and you stay jacked up, and you never get off. Fight. You just go looking for the next fight, the next fight, the next fight. Yeah, yeah. And it's a jacked up thing, and then all you do is just keep Fox News on or CNN on whichever version you are, and they'll feed it to you, and they'll make sure you're pissed off all twenty four seven. That's yep. how they get paid. Exactly, and uh, and if not, you can turn on your local news, and a tornado's gonna kill you. <laughs> but yeah, oh my God, there's a snowstorm. <laughs> it's like oh jeez. Get in the truck and drive to work. 
or don't. But pick one. Don't be ain't go be or don't. But don't, don't be, be don't, turn maniacal the t- about it. Turn the TV off. Turn it's, it off. It's, it's white powder. It's going to be okay. <sighs> It'll be all right. And so, um, yeah. And, and it, but the the wussification of America. This idea that we don't know how to fight through something, and then when we get into this, we don't have the the, we don't have the character structure to fight like a man. Instead, we fight like a boy. Mm. And Through stay, power and control. And jacked up, jacked angry. up bully mode uh, instead of manly, righteous anger at something that's truly principled and wrong. Mm. And so you become an activist. God help you. Because you don't have anything else to do. Mm. You know, it's just, it's weird. Yeah. It's weird. It's happening out there. And so if you're in those situations, folks, get get some help. Call somebody. Please call, call somebody. Call somebody. Get somebody in your corner. Walk you, walk you out of it. And put the phone down. This is the Ramsey Show. David is with us. David is in Louisville, Kentucky. Hi, David. How are you? I'm doing well, and uh, thanks for taking my call, Dave and George. I appreciate your guys' wisdom and opinion. So sure. uh, I'll try to be brief. Okay. And, um, uh a little groundwork. I'm an over-the-road truck driver. Uh, I am out five days at a time, and I have rotating weekends. My wife works full-time. Uh, I would say two full-time jobs. She also takes care of our kid all week while I'm gone. Um, so we have a 20-month-old, and we have a, a second baby boy coming in nine days. Wow. Um, so, yeah. Mama's got her hands full. Uh, um, I try to help while I'm there, uh, and this job does have predictable schedules, uh, which really helped a lot. But here's what happened. Uh, a lot of relational stuff and, and a little financial thing, but I, I do wonder your thoughts on the financial thing. So when we put the second car seat in the uh, – she had a small SUV. I was the one who said, you know, this thing's a little tighter than it needs to be in here uh, for you having to pack them out in and out all day by yourself. Um, we might look at some other options. So we talked about it. Could not agree on makes, models, anything. I'm looking at minivans. She's looking at SUVs. Um, we actually went and physically looked at some cars just to get some ideas, um, try to compromise on things. And there was a little compromise on cars, you know, different makes and models. Uh, and then we were trying to figure out what would be realistic in our range with the trade and all that. And uh, there were several – we both – got a little uh, sticker uh, eyeballs there and then tried to back away from that. Um, and there were several talks about, you know, we're not going to finance anything different than where we are now to get into the vehicle we need to be. Uh, you know, a lateral move is fine, but we're not going to go backwards. Um, next thing I know, Saturday, she sends me pictures of this van that she just went and picked up and uh, financed ten grand. Um, we owed five as it was on a car, and we had the money to pay it off. We were doing the stork mode thing, um, and I don't know i don't know if she just had a change of heart. We, we had a commitment conversation last night, and we agreed there's a lot of individual and relational counseling needed uh, to figure out how we even got to where we thought this was a good idea. My thought on the financial side is – we turn right back around and sell that van. And whatever the gap money is between the sell and paying off the loan, that's what we go by. Um, she seems to still think, I don't know at what level that this was a good idea and that we should keep it, uh, that it's just five grand further backwards um, and that we can, we can pay it off if we uh, buckle down. So I'm curious what your thought is there. Wow. Um, well, I'm vacillating between this lady's completely overwhelmed with two little uh, babies. She's pregnant, and and the fact that she completely lost her dadgum mind and That's went again and, and and went against everything in the relationship, lied to her husband, and acted like she wasn't even married. Um, so I mean, part of me is sympath- sympathetic to where she is and how overwhelmed she is, and I get all of that. But part of me is really ticked at her right now. And I, I suppose, and, and I suppose you're I probably ten x of both of those. Exactly, and and I do understand on the one hand, uh, not necessarily a van, but a bigger vehicle is the right choice of vehicle. The loan is completely separate from that. 
And well, and the de- but this decision making process that is completely exactly. out of control, bigger, yeah. you're not That's going to ever have anything financially until we solve whatever is broken there in her uh, in her mind on how relationships work. Um, so, I, I um, uh, uh, yeah, financially, what you need to do is sell the car. And you need to get a car that you can afford. Um, and also, that would probably be a good idea for her to do to recommit to your marriage, not necessarily to the Ramsey steps or something. You guys may decide together that you want to go deeply in debt. If you want to do that, that's fine. But whatever you, the, the first thing that has to happen is you all have to get on the same page and agree to keep your word to each other. You just can't have a relationship where you just don't keep your word to each other or where you act independently unilaterally of each other like this there's there's just no data that says that creates a quality relationship yeah the financial piece can be undone today but the relational piece the trust that's going to take a while to build back up and i think you're right that counseling is in order and on the financial side do you guys still have other types of debt outside of this car loan yeah how much Uh, how much uh, a little bit yeah they're working Uh, they're working baby step two we're close we had yeah, we had five grand left on the cars. This current car is now ten, so an additional five or six. Yeah. Um, she has a uh, seventeen thousand dollars student loan, which would have been the next thing we tackled, and then some petty collections that she has from old credit cards. Yeah, uh, my guess we, we is my guess is your wife feels like that she's been running her life by herself already for a long time because you're just never there. And um, she feels abandoned, and she just had to do what she had to do as an abandoned single mom. I'm, I'm thinking that's where she is emotionally. You don't feel like that's yeah, where she I is, but I think that. that's where she thinks she is. I, I agree with that. That that that's probably pretty fair for how she feels emotionally. I guess yeah. my concern is, you know, and I I don't downplay that at all, but uh, at least relationally and financially, we agreed to be on the same page, and then you went and did. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm I, I, I'm I'm livid of her breaking her word and and just doing this, but I'm trying to figure out what level of distress she must have been in to do that because it sounds like you all had very clear conversations, and then she just went and did whatever the flip she wanted to do anyway. So which it just tells me she's just in freakout mode, I guess. Yeah, I mean, because I I don't this lady does not sound like someone who is obstinate arrogant she doesn't sound like that person to me she sounds more like somebody who feels i think she's a cornered animal and she bit you you know what i'm saying yeah that's how it feels so you got to get to the bottom of that before you can fix this van thing the van problem is that is the symptom it's not the thing so and it, it may be dude you're coming off the road and you got little babies and she she's overwhelmed and you may be coming off the road and doing something else so that you can be there for your family for a season. I don't know. But uh, I do know you need to sit down with a marriage counselor for sure. I'm not qualified to unravel all this. I can just I can kind of get on her side for a minute, but there's no way to justify what she did on the other hand. So I can get on your side and be pissed about it too. I get it. I understand where your head is. But I'm trying to figure out what caused this so it doesn't happen again. That's the thing. Because if you don't break this, you're going to be broke your whole life. So a couple days ago, George and I took a call from an over-the-road truck driver who's, uh, he had been talking with his wife about trading cars, and uh, without talking to him, she went and traded cars and went further into debt. He was pretty irate about that because um, they didn't, were not in agreement about that, and she just went and did whatever she wanted to do. And uh, we talked to him for a few minutes. As The more we talked to him, the more, if you go back and listen to the call, uh, the more we were questioning what's really going on because he's like, he set her up, threw her under the bus pretty much. And then we're like, yeah, I think you probably, you're over the road. You, she's pregnant. She's do, got a baby doing nine days. And you probably, there's something else going on here. You, you read between you, the lines. I actually said you may need to come off the road and take care of your family and you guys need to get in marriage counseling. So um, she apparently was listening uh, or went back and listened to the call uh, and disagreed with a whole bunch of her uh, the things her husband said about her uh, and the conclusions we came to about her as a result uh, and so forth. So sent us a long email. Uh, and, and so we thought it'd be fun to kind of go back through that because it's really interesting. So here's the deal. Um, uh, 
Well, let's just say, okay. I listened yesterday, got to hear the call you took from my husband regarding the purchase of a van, resulted of financing 10 k I know responding probably won't get airtime to resolve the plethora of issues you two seem to pick up on, but I felt at least I could provide some context for my actions that would hopefully lead to a rebranding of my sanity, because I said she may have lost her dad gum mine, and accountability for the situation. The truth is partially, as you put it, I was backed into a corner and I bit back. So it sounded like they couldn't come into agreement and he's on the road, left her you know, stranded with a bunch of kids, and she just did whatever she wanted to do kind of thing. That was my point. And so um, then she goes on for about a page and a half explaining why it's okay to borrow money to buy a van and all this stuff, which, of course, is not true. Uh, My husband didn't mention that he's packed all of his things and moved out. That's true. He did not mention that and has taken half of our emergency fund with him uh, nine days before I deliver our second child. Oh, really? That's just nice. No, he didn't mention that because I probably would have ripped him a new one for doing that. It's like, if you're going to leave, you don't leave nine days before a baby comes, doob. Uh, you know, it, this didn't just suddenly happen. So, yeah, we would have, um, George and I would have teed off on him on that. Me more than George, but George, because George is generally I'm nicer. Too nice. Uh, she closes with, I'm not stupid, I've not lost my mind, but backed into a corner with no other resources or choices. I think I can own this one. And that's after rationalizing again for five paragraphs that buying the van was a good idea. So let's go back and recu- re- regroup on this whole thing for a little bit. Um, number one. I don't like it when any of you, none of us at Ramsey like it, when you take our good common sense advice that is meant for you to prosper in your family and you weaponize it to use it on your family or weaponize it to use it on your spouse. There's a thing in here where he says, she says, he, he refused any car I looked at because he, and, and he said, Dave always says, if the answer is no, we don't do anything. If the answer, if we can't come into agreement, the answer is no. Well, that's a general principle, yes. But what's going on here is you two are a hot mess. That's what's really going on here. Both of you, Jessica, you with your rationalization, which I completely understand how you get there in the middle of him being a control freak and you getting ready to have a baby, and I get all of that, but you rationalized your butt off, girl. I mean, it's ridiculous. And, and him with his lying to us and weaponizing advice that we give here and using it to verbally thrash his wife with, um, you, you guys desperately needed marriage counseling a long time ago. Long time ago. Yeah. Uh, long before he calls on this radio show. And uh, we certainly did not tell him to pack up his stuff and move on. And it sounds like he did and that. If you before go back he and listen to the call, nowhere did we even intimate that he should do that. We did tell him, "You guys need marriage counseling." And baby doll, you did need marriage counseling. You do need marriage counseling. It's, it, you guys are a hot mess. You 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 bow up and just go do whatever the crap you want to do and go deeply in debt and buy a van that you shouldn't have, uh, against his wishes, which indicates that you guys are not on the same page and have serious marriage problems. And he's being a twerp and a control freak and not coming up with some way to take care of his pregnant wife and kids and get her into a car that works. Well, to that end. Uh, Everybody this... wants what they want instead of being instead of serving each other in this marriage. She says, to quote him, I don't care if it has a welded five-gallon bucket for the front seat. You'll drive what I pick or I won't agree to it. Because Dave says if you can't agree, you go with who says no. So See, I buy that, it. Is that's not, that has never come out of here. I mean, we don't. That's just that's just completely weaponizing the advice here. So, yeah, Jessica, you have a mess. Your husband is a mess. You're in a mess. And you did a stupid thing in the middle of all that. And, and it hurt and, to have her laundry aired out, you know, yeah, on national sure. radio. Well, too. I don't blame her for that, sure. too. And I pick on a lady who's getting ready to have a baby in nine days. Oh, my gosh. So, uh, but the, the point is, guys, this is, if you can't get together on what to do with money, it's not a money problem. If you can't get together on what to do with your car, it's not a car problem. That's a marriage problem, and it's usually a selfishness problem. I mean, she was selfish because she just went and did whatever she wanted to do. He was selfish because he's like, I'm not going to agree to anything because I don't like it, and, I, and I'm on the road, and I'm going to hold all the power like he has any power, which apparently he didn't. So, uh, you know, it was just out of control. So the, the inverse of this is, hey, I love my wife, and I understand she's freaking out. i got to figure out some way to get her in a different car that is good for our future, and going further in debt is not good for our future, instead of, I'm going to tell you what to do, and Dave Ramsey, and they, oh, my God, you twerp. And they, they mentioned we didn't ask their income. They make $137,000. Yeah, and it paid off 
a bunch of debt, right? Yeah. How much was it? It was a lot. Uh, $50,000 in 15 months they paid off, she says. So, um, uh, what? You, but you didn't ask what we made, she said. Well, I didn't ask what you made because that wasn't the question. The question wasn't, a, it's not a, an income wasn't a math problem. It was my wife bought a car that we didn't agree to problem. That was the call. It wasn't like how much money you make. How much money you make doesn't solve, you know, you two not getting along. So you could make 237000 and still not – you still shouldn't go do that, and he still shouldn't put you in a position that you felt like that was the only thing you could do. So you two are being – you're a hot mess. You're a hot mess, and you need to be in marriage counseling, both of you. Bad. And so – because here's the thing. Sharon Ramsey goes and does that, I'm going to have a problem. But I'm also not going to put her in a position that she feels like that's her only way. And if she feels like that's her only way, then she's got a serious Cinderella syndrome, like she deserves it entitled and I'm arrogant and whatever – then we got another issue going on, and we're going to be sitting down with with a professional and helping us guide through our relationship because apparently we can't guide through it ourselves. And we've done that. Ten year, you know, after we were married about ten years, we about killed each other that year. And so we, you know, marriage counselor saved our lives and our marriage, saved my life because she probably would have killed me in my sleep. But um, <laughs> but the uh, uh, but I mean, you know, and and so I can I distinctly remember driving the crappy. You remember, this is how bad it was. You you probably have seen these on the road. They're still out there. The two-tone blue Astro vans. Oh, yeah. You remember those? Yeah, those were real ugly. This is like the minivan of minivans. And it had like a bazillion miles on it. And I fried the transmission out of it, pulling the boat, because it wasn't designed to pull a boat. It was a lightweight little thing. And I uh, put a new transmission in it. And this thing, I mean, it stunk. It had Cheerios like neck deep in it. All over. it was, we'd raised little babies in it and dogs. And it was a mess. And she was over this van. And rightly so. It was a piece of crap. And we were starting to make a little money. We finally got a little bit of money. And she's like, I want to get a Suburban. I want to get an SUV. I'm like, that's $20,000. Might as well be. that gum $200,000. What do you mean? Well, you got $20,000 coming in down there at your company, our company. You keep telling me it's mine. I want some of the money out of there. Buy an SUV. I'm like, yeah, but that twenty thousand dollars we can use to invest in this thing we're working on, and it's going to make us a hundred thousand if we buy this car for twenty thousand. And we went back and forth, and I went, Ugh. and we just we kept arguing. But finally, I had this moment where I went, you know what? It's not an either or; it's a win. And I said, so okay, we're gonna we need to do the investment at the company, and we need to buy the car. And which one? Which one we What's do first? Is, which one we do first is the only thing that mattered. And so we just put her first. She won. There we go. And you know what? When she won. I won. Boom. Isn't that interesting? Woo! Here's the takeaway from this story, Dave. They've got a child on the way, and right now they're both being children. We need less children in this family. How's that? Now you'll get another email, George. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. We changed her brand. (laughs) This is the Ramsey Show. Michelle is with us in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Dave, I'm great. How are you? Thank you for taking my call. Sure. What's um, up? Very exciting. Um, my husband and I are on our uh, baby set too. Uh, it's been amazing, and to encourage people out there, if you're starting this journey at 58, it's not too late, and they can change your life. So, and the second most important part is that my husband wants to know what you think for investing, and would you advise sort of to hedge against inflation? Um, buying like gold, some gold coins as part of your emergency fund. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, no, and I wouldn't suggest you buy stock in Home Depot either or Apple or mm-hmm. Exxon. Uh, why? Because the price is too volatile to use as an emergency fund. The purpose of the emergency fund mm-hmm. is insurance not investment it's there for the rainy day the umbrella is there for rain only it is not there to fight off bears it's just for rain that makes sense yes indeed um so as so let's say we have the emergency fund in cash that's all you need maybe it's an extra you can put it in the bank in a savings account if you want and Michelle, I'll go. Oh, right. And I would go a step further 
too, because you were wondering, you said my husband wanting to know about investing and then specifically in gold, but nowhere in the baby steps do we recommend people buy gold, period. So, and neither single stocks either, like he was saying, but when it comes mm -hmm. to investing in that time, still not suggest investing in commodities or anything like that. So in the market, yes, through good growth stock mutual funds or in a retirement vehicle, like a IRA, Roth IRA, 401k, 403b, but in general, our piece of advice when it comes to investing is to stay away from gold. So let me kind of talk you through something too that's interesting. So what this tells me, by the way, and the way you asked the question was that your husband's been reading crap on the internet, okay, on gold sites. Because a he should I buy this, you said, as a hedge against inflation, okay? Now let's talk about how that works. Here's the way it, you've heard of a hedge fund, right? Now, yeah. a hedge against something goes with the thing so the thing doesn't destroy you, meaning that if you want to do a hedge against inflation, you would have to buy things that are incorporated in inflation. Inflation is the price of bread going up, the price of oil going up, the price of housing going up, the price of electricity going up, uh, the price of living going up. Gold is not one of those things. It does not follow inflation. There is no correlation between the price of gold and inflation. Zero. There's no correlation between the stock market going up and the stock market going down in gold. Zero. There is some loose correlations that really what gold prices correlate to is fear or greed. When the marketplace deems that the world's falling apart, oh, God, and all the conspiracy theorists come out, then the price of gold is going to go up. But that's what drives the price of gold up, not anything else. And so if you really want to hedge against inflation, you buy real estate, you would buy stock in Exxon, you would buy stock in wheat farms, you would buy stock in things that go up in cost when inflation goes up, when the price of things goes up, the things. You'd buy stock in General Motors because the price of a car is going to go up. You'd buy stock in Bridgestone because the price of tires are going to go up. That's a hedge against inflation. Gold coins are not. The only place anybody says stuff like that is on their stupid butt gold coin websites. That's the only place that comes up. That's how I know where he's getting the information because it's technically the wrong definition. Does that make sense? Yes, but mm. it, so when gold is going up in price, is that's it, inflation. Is gold was, is this, no, right, that's inflation. Does gold hold its value? No, not necessarily. Value. You go back and pull the gold. You can just go online and pull up gold prices over fifty years. Mm -hmm. And number one, you're going to see about a five percent rate of return. It's got a sucky rate of return, and it's a freaking roller coaster at Six Flags to get there. It's way up and way down just to get to an av a boring average. That's why I don't play in it, because it's too freaking volatile. It's too crazy a ride, and I don't find any millionaires that say, I got rich buying gold coins. None. I find a lot of people that got poorer buying gold coins, but I don't find any millionaires in our millionaire study that says I got rich buying gold coins. So this is where it comes from. Yeah, and there, but there is a level, because I just had a conversation with a friend about this recently. There's like this level of security feeling like, yeah, but gold feels safe. Gold, it feels like... I don't know, because you can actually tangibly touch it and see it, whatever the case may be, there's this element of like, oh, yeah, we're going to buy gold because it just feels it feels safer. That's yeah. what they were saying. And well, it, here's, what, here's the weird part of that is. It's not. When, when is it safe? When do you use gold coins? When do you use a bar of gold to buy something? Never. Okay? I mean, go back to a complete collapse of government and anarchy in the streets. You know what happens then? The first type of economy that rises up is a barter-based economy. So when Katrina hits New Orleans and wipes the freaking place off the map because all the levees broke and the whole place is laying down on the floor crying, no one ran around with gold bars buying stuff. But a can of gasoline, some brand new blue jeans, some work gloves, some bullets, you could trade that for anything for about six weeks down there. Right now, you can trade two befores for just about anything in America, okay, with the price of lumber. Yeah. But nobody's walking around with gold dust in their pockets. This is not the wild, wild west. We have a medium of exchange, primarily electronic, but also these little green 
paper things with presidents' faces on them. That is our medium of exchange. So this anomaly, this this weird thing. All gold is safe. Everything goes to gold when all the when all hell breaks loose and the world falls apart. No, it doesn't. I mean, you walk through Baghdad after they kill Saddam Hussein. Nobody's walking around the streets there with little gold bars doing stuff. Immediately comes up with the next dictator's face on a piece of paper, and this becomes your currency following a barter, black market barter economy, which is what follows anarchy. So you go from anarchy to stabilization, and there's always a currency that pops up following yeah. in the, with the next government. I mean, when the Civil War broke out, the South, they didn't run around with gold bars. They printed up Southern money, which became worth nothing <laughs> once they were defeated, right? We were defeated. I was here. I wasn't here, but I'd live here. But <laughs> anyway, but I probably wasn't that old. But anyway, but the, uh, you know, I mean, same thing. I got these little pictures of Saddam Hussein on paper money that this guy in special forces brought me back and three bullets from an AR, right? When he was on a thing there. And you know what that paper money's worth? Nothing. Because the people that supported it are worth nothing. It's gone. But there was never any gold backing any of it up. But so then why does fear drive it? Because you see, I mean, like the joke is, I feel like on cable news networks, it's always gold commercial, you know, commercials. Yeah. yeah selling gold and that's it's it's on this false premise that if everything goes to hell yeah. in a handbasket you're then, safe you're then safe you're gonna be it. okay if you got a gold bar in your safe yeah well that's so much crap it's unbelievable it just doesn't work that way you know you cannot find a failed economy consequently a failed government that has completely collapsed where gold pops up as the standard it just doesn't not in the last 300 years 500 years you find me one time in history. You can study it. You can't, you know, Nazi Germany, Hitler takes over. It's on a failed economy, by the way. That's what put Hitler in place. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, they had hyperinflation. Her question was about inflation. Hyperinflation. We'll borrow a load of money to buy a dadgum loaf of bread. So Hitler comes in to save the day. He's going to fix everything with a stimulus check, you know. So, uh, and goes into power. That's what happened. And, and, but they never once went to a gold standard. Today's question comes from John in California. John writes, my wife and I are approaching 60 and have been married for 30 years. She's had a gambling problem since we got married and it's getting progressively worse. She keeps promising to quit, but every month spends thousands of dollars on her hobby. Hobby? I'm just going to underline that just one just real mark, quick. mark that number, yeah. yeah. All right. She has a job but never uses her income toward our family expenses. To add to the mess, we had a daughter that I believed to be mine until she had a DNA test that showed we are not related. So in a nutshell, our marriage is a long-term sham. At this point, I have zero interest in finding a different wife, so I see two possible paths. I'll go ahead and mark that one. We can either divorce and split our net worth with me, possibly getting strapped with alimony payments for the rest of my life, or I can put up with her nonsense of slowly bleeding down our savings and investments. From a practical point of view, it may be, quote-unquote, cheaper to keep her, but I'd still have to deal with the mental mess. What would you do in my situation? John, you are a freaking tragedy. Wow, it's like a country song. It's like two country songs. And, you know, I, I love how you just completely painted yourself into the corner and there's only two possible scenarios out of this, <laughs> and both of them you die. Exactly. I mean, exactly. it's like... <laughs> I'm going to starve to death or or have a yeah. psychotic break. Yeah, I'm going gonna, gonna to absolutely lose my mind or we're going to be cheaper to keep her and I'm going to tolerate it. You are making an excuse for tolerating this all these years because you had manned up and dealt with the problems in the last 30 freaking years. Every home is built with a door on it, John. Every home. And if somebody's lying to you about the whether your kid, they're stealing. I mean, good grief! Yeah, you got to deal with this ASAP. And the, uh, you're gonna get me all fired up, dude. You need to. You need to answer the question. That's why Here's here. the question: Number one, a gambling problem is an addiction, not a hobby. Stop painting it with this milk toast, wet toast language. It's an addiction. You're married to someone who is struggling with an addiction. Number two, she's never used. She has a job, but she never used income towards her family expenses. That's your fault. Correct. Number three, we have a daughter that I believe to be mine. My nut, my marriage is a long-term sham. Maybe, but if it is, it's because you've participated in this long-term sham. Okay, I want you to look in the mirror. On None this. of this is new information. Correct. At this point, we have zero interest in finding a different wife. That is completely irrelevant to the point that you are worth more than living in a home where somebody is using you as toilet paper. Stop. Stop. Nonsense. 
You don't have to be interested in finding a different wife. You can be interested in preserving your dignity, taking care of your mental and physical health, and helping your wife not deal with her hobby, but possibly get help because she's ill. <sighs> Should we continue? Mm-hmm. You can at least, you can divorce. I'm never going to tell somebody to get divorced, but this is a mess. You've been cheated on. You have been, someone's liquidating your money. You need to go see an attorney and or a marriage counselor today is what I'm saying. It's but a mess. It, here's the thing. People do stupid butt stuff. Absolutely. That are harmful to other people. And if it happens to you once, you know, shame on her. If it happens to you twice, happens to you three times, happens to you four times, shame on you. Happens to you over 30 years since we got married. Shame on you for not dealing with it. Right. And, and so... Uh, Dave Rams is shaming someone. Oh, brother. You dadgum snowflakes. Um, but the, uh, the deal is this. It is your fault that you haven't dealt with this before now. Correct. And so, and you act like you're somehow stuck. You're not stuck. No, that's the, t- uh, the title of my new book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future. Thanks for the underhand pitch here, John, from California. You've got to own what is. And what is is you've allowed this you've yep. allowed yourself to participate in somebody else's illness or their addiction or their bad behavior, whatever you want to call it, for thirty years. So t- tell me, John, on this. What I read is this lady is messed up mm-hmm. and he's almost as messed up as she is. Yes. So I have it's hard for me to be hopeful that both of them can come around. She has at, why would she change her life? Her life is fantastic. She gets to do whatever she wants. Whatever she wants. Whenever she wants. With no consequence. And he, and he just she, looks at her. She lives in a rent-free and, and he just, home. He just whines and bitches Someone else it. pays her yeah. food. And what else. Yeah. But never does anything about it. Yeah. So and, here's the deal. I mean, yeah. in other words, he can come in tomorrow and with the help of a counselor, say, we're going to go to a marriage counselor. And in order for me to stay, here's what has to happen. Right. An ultimatum. Yep. Okay. No more gambling. Yep. And your money becomes our money. And um, any more, anything that looks or smells anything like infidelity, we're done. Right. I mean, these are non-negotiables. He could come in tomorrow, and then she could say, um, oh, you're right. After 30 years of doing it this way, I'm just going to stop tomorrow. Right. Um, <laughs> probably not, right? <laughs> not but happen. here's what, here's what, probably, what, what is going to happen. It's not a matter of him saying, well, then I guess I have to do this. What he has to do is draw boundaries, and then she gets to choose. Do I want to be in a relationship with him? Yeah, and she's already chosen that, by the way. That's for 30 years she has. Yeah, right. that she doesn't. That's right. So, so um, John, you got to start. These are two lazy people. Uh, they're lazy in that they will say, not deal with their stuff. Yeah, I was going to say intellectually, or they're just so traumatized. Emotionally lazy, yeah. yeah. But whatever the reason is, is they're, they're not dealing with their stuff, either yeah. one of them, Yeah, is what I'm seeing. So, I mean, I just it's just old boy, good old boy stuff. But anyway, yeah, so that's what I, you, you are going to, if you're asking us what to do, we would say you're going to sit down with a therapist, and uh, you're going to say these are the conditions under which I stay, or you're going to just say I'm calling it a day, click out, peace out and get an attorney and to presuppose that you're always going to pay alimony you probably are after 30 years but that also is a negotiation and uh, she probably wants free of you and let me say this not tongue-in-cheek john you don't know what going to bed just going to sleep feels like without medication you don't know what it's like laughing from your guts anymore you don't know what it's like to be with just a group of buddies and y'all are having a good time You've lost that sense of joy. And what I would tell you is you're approaching 60. You got what, 30 years left. You can choose from this point forward to make those 30 years the best 30 years of your 60. Or you can choose to. Oh, this, 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 wait. The point is both paths are going to be hard. Choose which kind of hard you want. You want hard where you slowly drown or you want hard where you slowly stand back up. You get to pick. Yeah. You get to pick. It is way past time to stand up, dude. Stand up, John. All right, today's question comes from Jennifer in Kansas. My husband is 100% sure that the world will end soon or martial law will take effect and money will not hold any value. Because of this, he will not save. He has business and personal credit card debt. He has zero savings and spends his money as fast as he makes it. He's up to date on his payments but has no interest in paying them off so he can start saving. I am currently saving as much as possible and will have the last of my debt paid off later this year. I have life insurance in place for all of us and a 401k. He will also be able to draw my pension at my old job if I should pass before he does. I feel like I'm the only one preparing for our future and honestly, it's hurtful. 
I don't know how to get through to him that even though the world may end in our lifetime, we should still be responsible with our money and be prepared. How can I get through to him? Dave, how can she get through to him? Um, well, I mean, the extreme way you've explained him, this is not somebody who's merely a prepper. This is not someone who is merely feels like that the culture is uh, deteriorating. This guy is so sure, that he's so paranoid, that, that the whole thing is going to crash down that he, according to you, this is according to Jennifer, that, that he is doing nothing responsible. Uh, he's just living his life today. Now, or he's a complete liar, and this is his excuse for being a freaking child right? Um, and doing whatever he wants to do. Either way, this guy is exercising at a level of mental illness that is pretty extreme. Right. This is a paranoia situation. Or it's a depression that is lapsed into, I, I, I literally can't think through to, to tomorrow, so I'm just living for the next five minutes, the next ten minutes. Yeah. And um, I'll create this narrative, and I will find some websites yeah. that will back up my narrative. Well, there, there's there's a thousand of these conspiracy millions of them, websites, yeah. and you know, and you, all you got to do is watch the news, and it makes them all come true. <laughs> That's exactly right. You know? And uh, but they're not, you know. So um, let, let me just tell you that that, that, that the world has problems, mm -hmm. and uh, the world has always had problems. A hundred percent of the time. And uh, but the uh, Percentage likelihood of martial law and of you losing all of your personal assets coming together in your lifetime is so small that to believe that 100% to the point that it affects your behavior where you do nothing responsible for your family is called paranoia. That is a mental illness level. This is not merely we have a disagreement about how life works. This is you are, your husband is mentally ill. And so let me... Am I wrong? No, and in fact, here... <laughs> Dave, um, what, I had a season the doc, of uh, I mean. life when um, I had, uh, you and I have talked about this, I had mapped out in a very um, beautiful mind kind of way where this data point led to this one and this one, and I wasn't well. And I had come to figure out that oh, the housing market was going to recollapse and they were going to have to nationalize. House. I had created this whole world. And so I was going to cash out this and go do this. And I'll never forget sitting with the CFO of a $200 million company. I sat down and explained what I was about to do with my retirement. I was going to cash it out because money's not going to. And I remember him gently looking at me and saying, I don't really understand this. Please don't do this. And I left that meeting and I thought, he didn't see it. He didn't get it. And <laughs> I'm a guy that barely knows how to work a spreadsheet, right? So here's the thing. Um, when somebody is in this position, the data and facts don't help a lot. With somebody in this position needs to go get help. Yeah. I had to go sit down with somebody yeah. and say, I'm, I'm seeing the world different than everyone around me who loves me, and I need some help. Yeah. And you're right. The world's got problems. It does. Um, one of my close friends gave me a quote that has stuck with me forever. and He said, John, I got a lot of plans, but I don't have a meteorite plan. If a meteorite hits us, I will deal with that on that day. And the idea that suddenly money's going to hold no value and tanks are going to roll on every street. If that happens, I'll deal with that on that day. And until then, I'm going to be responsible and care for my wife who feels like she's drowning over here by herself. And we're going to go from there. Yeah. I mean, it's not going to give in to that because it's futile, right? Yeah. It's just futile. Yeah. There, there, there's, yeah. He, he needs to see. He needs help. He, he needs to see a counselor. He needs help. So, Jennifer, no amount of you sitting down trying to explain stuff to him is going to help How can here. I get through to him? You can't. You cannot. You cannot. Because his brain is not functioning properly. Right. If somebody in his life that he is somebody that he trusts that would sit down with him and say, hey, let's go talk to somebody, great. If you say, hey, I'm going to go talk to someone, I'd love you to join me, that'd be great. Um, but he needs to get some help. Yeah. I, I don't, I, and by the way, he, he doesn't think he needs help, so that's probably going to be very difficult. So, but just to, the, the point is, is that this is not, he is, you're, you're not going to solve this riddle. You don't have the tool set. I did have a, a friend that came and spoke truth to me. My wife spoke truth to me, and I wasn't this bad, um, but uh, that was helpful. It was two people that I trusted, and I said, I'm going to go talk to somebody then. Yeah, well, I, and I think you might get some guidance from a, a, a good counselor if you were seeing one on how to deal with this situation. Because here's what's ultimately going to happen, okay? Having dealt with couples in your situation for 30 years, one of two things is going to occur. And there's really not much middle ground. There's not a third thing. It's one of two. 
he is going to recognize this, get some help, and gradually over time get better, and your lives are going to get better and get more normalized, and you're going to be able to aim at a future and build a, build some wealth and get out of debt and start living reasonably. Mm-hmm. And you're going to start taking some incremental, not instantaneous, but some incremental steps in that direction, which will give you hope. If that does not occur, 100% of the time, at some point you are going to boil over a switch is going to flip, and you're going to be done. And there's there's going to be no talking you back. Because when ladies in particular are done after holding their breath for a decade or for three years or for whatever, when they're done, you can't switch them back on. You can't switch them back into love mode. It's You're in resentment, and that's ash. It's, just, it's right. over. That's right. It's over. And uh, because they, they've... they've they they reach that I've had it moment and it's there they really have had it and it, they're really gone and so don't let that happen to you uh, it's going to happen to you if you don't control the process now you can control the process and you say okay I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give him this much time I'm gonna try these five things to encourage him and at that point I'm gonna call this because this relation I can't be married to a crazy person and he is mentally ill darling he's mentally ill we just diagnosed it um, Dave. <laughs> Some of this feels like a self-fulfilling prophecy to me, that if you get enough people saying, well, money's going to be of no value, so let's just blow it all and run up all of our debts and go, but that that's the quickest way for money to have some serious problems, right? Is that fair? I don't know enough about monetary policy. that It just feels like you're, we're starting well, to see a... <laughs> what, what Rabbi Lappin says, he says, money is not actual, it's spiritual. Hmm. So when I give you a $100 bill... The actual paper is not worth $100. Right. It's a spiritual transaction of trust. And so when I give you a $100 bill, you accept that $100 bill for $100 in goods and services, or you get eyes get big and you say thank you, or whatever it is, because you trust that you can take that and do something with it. Mm-hmm. And so what you're saying is, and it's a valid point, that if enough people lose that trust, then the money is destroyed. Elizabeth starts this hour in San Antonio. Hi, Elizabeth. How are you? Hi, I'm doing great. Um, so, what's going on? And I actually wish I was calling to say to do my debt free scream. I've been wanting to do that for a long time. Uh, we are debt free. The house is paid off, the cars are paid off, everything. Um, I am working full time and a student also. And then uh, in about a year, I'll go full time um, where I won't work also for nursing. Um, and my husband, he works full time. He's a PhD uh, scientist. Mm-hmm. And then we have a 18 year old son who has moved out and started a business. He didn't want to go to college. And cool. then the Elizabeth, how can we help today? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, just wanted to lay the foundation. So we've got everything paid off, and my husband wants to buy an all electric vehicle. And we were going to pay, um, save up for it to pay cash. And currently we have two Prius that are um, not the plug-in kind. And suddenly now, today, he wants to go purchase it. He feels like there's a sudden need that we need to do it now because of everything that's going on in the world and that this is the time, not wait. So we're also cash flow in my school. And so we do have I'm sorry, what's going on in the world that demands that you get a plug-in vehicle today? I I missed, (laughs) I, I didn't watch the news this morning. So he feels like we, um, like, potentially in the future. We're going to have no gas. Uh, that we, yeah, yeah, and that we would be better off getting it now. That just to, we so have he, always he, talked he, about he, getting the he, electric Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you telling me the guy has a Ph.D. and he truly believes there's going to be no <laughs> gasoline? No, not no gas. No, just, okay, so we're both very frugal and we... Um, so, you know, the what is going on in the work. world that demands that you buy an electric vehicle? You said he think with all that's going on in the world, what the crap does mm-hmm. that mean? Well, that the demand for electric vehicles is going up and that they are harder and harder to get. And there's a long wait list for, you know, all the ones that are on the market right now. Oh. Um, and in other words, that- I want an electric vehicle. <laughs> and I don't want to wait in a and long I don't want to wait. And so I'm just now, well, I'm, now I'm making up like, crap to know. worry about. Okay, so what's your household Six income? Months. So our household income is about 155 
Okay. He makes one thirteen. I make about forty three. Okay. And what are you gonna? What, what are you buying? What kind of a car is he wanting? Like a Tesla? Um. So we're between the VW uh, ID four. Mm-hmm. The Bolt was just recalled on Friday, so we can't get that one, which yeah. was much less expensive. Mm-hmm. And then our only other option really is the Tesla. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let me help you with the math to start with. Mm-hmm. You can drive that freaking Tesla to the moon and back, and mathematically you will never justify how much more you've mm-hmm. spent on the Tesla than you're paying on than you than the value of your Prius. You know how much time yeah. it's going to take you to recoup forty five thousand dollars in electric and gas savings the rest of your mm-hmm. freaking life okay in so let me just tell you mathematically feel. this is asinine that we're using the idea that we're saving money because we're frugal to get an electric car now if mm-hmm. you want to go get a Tesla fine go get your Tesla but pay cash for it mm-hmm. but you don't you don't say Oh, everything that's going on in the world, and we're frugal people. Because both of those mm-hmm. things are stupid butt statements. Because they don't have anything to do with reality, okay? They're, you know, everything that's going on in the world, they're making Teslas. You can get a Tesla. I mean, there's not, you know, and they're, they're not going to be, like, not able to get one. And if you're not able to get one, like a DeLorean, it, that means you didn't want <laughs> one because they went broke, okay? And Elon didn't make it, you know. But, um but the uh, but if you get one, which is fine, I got several friends that have bought them. Um, I prefer a motor, but that's okay. Get you one, It'll get you a battery. It's okay. Mm-hmm. And so, but but the point is, you guys make enough money to pay cash for a sixty thousand dollar car. Mm-hmm. Here's what I think: in happened. cash, and you wait till you buy it. When when our brains go to fight or flight, when we're scared, it actually has a cool bypass mechanism in your brain that turns off your critical thinking part of your of your brain because you it didn't want you sitting at the front of a cave wondering is that a nice tiger or is that a fluffy one a petting tiger it just wanted you to run or to grab a stick and go to war because if if it happened to be a mean tiger and you thought it was a nice one you were going to be dead right and so it's a cool little feature our brains have where it trades it trades speed for accuracy close enough and it sounds like you've got a, a husband who loves you, loves your kids, and is consuming 24-7, 365 news, and he's worked himself up in a panic, and he's sitting there at home, and at home, and at home, and what I need to do, I need to do something, I need to do something, and he can go down a rabbit hole that's going to shoot him out one media uh, slide that's going to tell him we're going to be out of oil, it's going to be $111 a gallon, it's going to be this and that. And then he comes up with a solution that makes no mathematical sense, rational sense, climate sense. It makes no sense, but it feels like it's the right thing to do. And what I need that guy to do is to close the devices, get connected to a human being, go sit down and tell somebody, I'm terrified and I'm about to make a wild decision that doesn't make any mathematical sense, doesn't make any rational sense. That I'm I'm not I'm not okay. And it's right contrary now. to my goals. It's it's not where I want to be. The goals the goals of this family right. have been to become and be debt free, and out of left field, Mr. PhD dumps into the middle and goes, Ah, I'm, we gotta finance a Tesla. I'm gonna buy a depreciating computer. Not be any and everything that's going on in the world, right. and it's like right. you're right. His brain is completely shut down. And so let's go it's to the devoid end. of critical. Let's thinking go to skills. the end result. The end thing here. Let's say there we do run out of gas, Dave, or the gas becomes one hundred and seventy. Oh, jeez! I'm just having fun for a second. It's and not it, fun, and it does. Having an electric car will be the your neighbors will line up in your driveway to shoot you if you're the only electric car. <laughs> so the world that you are predicting that you're going to solve for is not going to look like the world you have now. Plus, you have an electric car. So it's okay that when I panicked, I bought bullets. <laughs> I said, I'm, <laughs> I'm not saying that's okay. I'm saying that. Yeah, whatever. Yes. Way to go, Dave. So what I'm saying is when you solve for chaos, you're solving an improbable math problem, right? So what does that mean? It means you're not okay. Yeah. Your husband spun out, yeah. and he needs to put the computer down, put the debit card down, and go sit down and talk to somebody. He's not okay. If you enjoyed this episode, click here to watch the next one. You're going to hear the biggest financial mistakes our callers have ever made.